Uh, so our next speaker is Dr. Corinne Kleinhaus. She is an obstetrician by training. She is in charge of business development. Help me, what's your title? She kind of does everything for Pluristem in the United States. Um, Dr. Kleinhaus and I have been talking for the last two years. I've been following Pluristem for the last six or seven years. Uh, Dr. Kleinhaus has a very good understanding of the cell therapy space. So here to walk us through the programs that Pluristem has and just give us some idea of kind of the pipeline, uh, that's where I think we should start off. Okay, excellent, thanks Jason. Yeah, I see you're on a serious marathon today, so I'm very impressed that you're still smiling and standing or sitting. Um, so my company's Pluristem and we make cell therapies we target a variety of diseases with different products, each of which is a pretty much an unmet need with poor treatment options, and most of which are also very large um, global market sizes. We have uh, our own manufacturing facility, which is uh, quite a big differentiator in the space. The facility and our manufacturing processes are approved by the FDA, the EU, and the Japanese PMDA. Uh, and we have a uh, very large capacity at the facility, though we are still in clinical trials and are, uh, don't need to use it quite yet. Um, we have a very strong balance sheet. We have 44 million in the bank as of December 31st, no debt. Uh, and we've had a, uh, a very interesting pipeline and some very recent developments that have made it even um, more uh, exciting, at least uh, for this upcoming year. Uh, I'll walk you through it very quickly. I know we don't have a lot of time. Um, our first product is something called PLXPAD. And what it does is address uh, diseases that are related to inflammation, to fibrosis and muscle injury, uh, and also to, um, to ischemia in the tissue, tissue that doesn't have enough blood flow. The way all our products work, and this product of course as well, um, is the cells are injected into the muscle with no matching, uh, with a simple syringe, and they sense chemical distress signals from damaged tissue, and in response, depending on the product, they secrete a range of therapeutic proteins to address the issues of that disease. So with our first product, our lead indication is something called critical limb ischemia, which is when cholesterol blocks blood flow to the legs, uh, and you have um, damage, gangrene, and major amputation. Uh, it's a very risky and life-threatening disease with poor treatment options. So in our case, we had um, made a lot of progress. We really wanted to shorten time to market, and a company our size, that's obviously a key thing that we want to achieve. We identified two opportunities, both of which we were lucky enough to, um, to achieve, to reach. The first one is in Europe. There's something called the Adaptive Pathways Project where um, European uh, EMA will give you guidance and help you as you design a phase two trial, which if successful can be the basis for applying for marketing authorization. We're one of only a few companies in the world that were accepted into that pathway. Uh, and we're working now on getting our final protocol. We estimated it to be about 180 patients. In Japan, there's a similar trial in regenerative medicine, generally, um, which again lets you apply for marketing approval, conditional marketing approval, after a single phase two trial. Our study was, uh, protocol was approved in 70, for 75 patients, again, for critical limb ischemia, and we're uh, very excited at that opportunity to save several years and obviously tens of millions of dollars in development costs. And that uh, also makes us uh, interesting to pharma which would also like to save tens of millions of dollars in several years in development costs and development time. Um, we have very nice trial data for muscle injury, which I'll skip over since I know I have very little time. Um, that's something that we had uh, very nice phase two data and we're looking to partner out. Our second product, um, which is called PLXR18, the proteins secreted from there target bone marrow function. So, or bone marrow dysfunction. Um, we have two lead indications there. The first one is uh, being funded and uh, paid for and conducted by the US government. The uh, NIH has been running trials with this for uh, treatment of acute radiation syndrome, which is how you die after a bomb um, or a reactor meltdown. 
Um, they did two small animal trials, which showed really um, beautiful results. The, in the first one, we had about 100% survival in the treated animals who had been irradiated, and about 30% survival in the untreated animals who had been irradiated. The second trial, they looked at mechanism of action. It's quite an elegant study. Uh, and they're now initiating dose evaluation trials in large animal model um, as the basis for a pivotal trial in large animal models. This would be approved through the animal rule where there's no human efficacy uh, trials, and that's uh, initiating this year as well. The second uh, indication for this second product is um, bone marrow transplant failure, and we've received FDA clearance to start a phase one trial um, in the U.S. as well for that indication. And that's as fast as I can go. I don't know uh, what, how you'd like to go from here. Well, no, I'd like to think about a couple of things, but you didn't mention preeclampsia, and you, you I and I talked about that. that right. Yeah, and, you know, given your training, uh, and, and, you know, is that a program that we'll be hearing more from as well? That is the plan. So preeclampsia, we had done a series of preclinical of animal trials, small animal trials, uh, and we had very nice results. We also did a series of toxicology trials. It was looked at at Charles River Labs, where the cells were given to um, pregnant mice, uh, and we saw no problems, no health um, signatures either in the mother or in the developing fetus. Um, these are for preeclampsia, which is a uh, disease of pregnancy where um, there's high blood pressure, there can be uh, end organ damage. It occurs in about 3% of pregnancies. In 1%, there's severe preeclampsia, and women can have seizures, liver failure, kidney failure, and death. It's actually one of the leading killers of pregnant women around the world and about 3% of U.S. pregnancies uh, are afflicted with preeclampsia, and there's no treatment except for take, delivering the baby, which could be at five or six months with a lot of, um, obviously, problems um, after that. So we had a lot of very nice uh, animal data. We applied to the FDA to start a phase one, and they requested for us an additional um, set of toxicology of you know, safety studies in small animals, which we are conducting now. Um, and we're very, very eager to finish that and resubmit to begin a phase one. Obviously, it's a little tricky to do um, trials on pregnant women, but at this point, um, the disease is so dangerous for both the women and the um, fetus if it's delivered early that we're hopeful that um, the need for treatments will be recognized and we'll be able to proceed. So, you know, one of the things that I think about a great deal was the competitive landscape, but we heard from Mesoblast, Atherosis follows this presentation, and what Atherosis, Mesoblast, and Pluristem share in common is their allogeneic, essentially ready, uh, off-the-shelf, readily available. Um, Atherosis is pushing very hard on stroke, right. pushing very hard in Japan. Mesoblast is approved in Japan in GVHD through Prochymal but also is in a pivotal trial on congestive heart failure. And I think you and I spoke earlier and I said, I believe the tide can lift all boats. That yes. if mesoblast is successful, if atherosis is successful, and I don't even mean if, as an analyst I have to say if, but I really want to change that to when, right. uh, um, that, that pluristem de facto will benefit. So what I want to understand from pluristem in particular is, I think mesoblast, atherosis, and pluristem have struggled over the last five years because there are so many indications where these allogeneic cells have so much functionality. One is treating ischemic disease, whether it's congestive heart failure, whether it's a heart attack, whether it's stroke. But there's also an immunological component. We're seeing a lot of that from from mesoblast in particular. It's been talking about RA and diabetes. Atherosis has been talking about GVHD. But they've, they've been forced and focused in on a couple of indications. Where should I be focusing exactly with pluristem? Because I've been hearing about muscle industry, right. sorry, muscle inju injury, uh, acute radiation syndrome, right. uh, graft versus host disease, engraftment, bone marrow transplantation, uh, critical limb ischemia. So, y you know, I, What's I, the focus yeah, where where's, is, are we going to see? Th I, I think that right. Pluristem must be feeling the pressure in the competitive landscape the way I see it. Is that true? Um, well, I don't feel particularly pressured. I, I have to agree with you that um, everyone's success is our success as well. It's a young field. We're all looking at different indications. And the better any of us does, the better it is for, for everyone. There's plenty of room for success. 
Um, I would say for us, we have two very different products with two very different secretion profiles, which we've shown you know, work differently. Um, so we'd really have to divide that by product. So the first product, the lead indication, is definitely um, critical limb ischemia and muscle injury. We're looking at the functionality, which is growing new vessels, reducing inflammation. There's definitely immune um, modulation involved in both those processes on uh, reducing fibrosis. So that that's sort of the, the functionality, the range of functionality of the product, but those would be our two lead indications um, where we have uh, data. And the second product is really um, hem working on hematogen, gen you know, working on blood cells uh, being produced by the bone marrow in sort of simple terms. And um, that has a lot of applications. We've chosen one, the US government's chosen the other, but you know, along the line, there's certainly a lot of ways that, um, that this can be used. As a matter of fact, we have a, uh, memorandum of Understanding with Fukushima Medical University in Japan, where you know we just had the five-year anniversary of the um, reactor meltdowns there, uh, and they are studying our cells as well for acute radiation syndrome, but also as an adjunct to radiation therapy for cancer. Um, they're looking to see if they can use higher levels of radiation and then rescue um, with our cells. So. I think that in our case, we're looking at the functionality of each product, and then we line up the indications just, you know, we have to prioritize. So tell me a little bit about what it's been like to deal with the European Union on that pathway and in Japan on that pathway. And I think we're talking CLI in Japan and we're talking muscle injury. Um, CLI in Europe Okay, as well. good, thank yeah. you. Um, so it's, it's been, uh, in some senses, a, a learning experience because there's very few people who've gone through either pathway, um, but it's been a very positive one. We got a lot of uh, support and help um, getting into the pathway, and we've had very regular meetings with senior EMA officials uh, in Europe as we develop our protocol. So it, it's been a real opportunity. Um, but it did take time to understand exactly what was needed and, and how the pathways worked there. Uh, similarly, in Japan, we're one of just a few companies that got accepted, so there wasn't really a very clear um, you know, path. And it took us a little time to figure out, again, what the PMDA wanted. Um, but now that they've approved both our protocol and our factory and the manufacturing process, we feel um, you know, really uh, excited and lucky to be able to proceed there. And you mentioned manufacturing, and one of the things that definitely separates Pluristem from many of the other companies is the manufacturing facility. Tell me a little bit about how that decision was made, and uh, I think you did mention, but I, I'd like you to mention it again, has that been inspected by the U.S. and Europe? Is that a certified facility, and what does that mean for the company in terms of cost of goods? Great. So um, the manufacturing was actually uh, at the, the beginning of the company, the CEO, when he came on, made the decision that um, because cells are so sensitive to how you make them, and the process of which we um, expand the cells is how we push them into different products, he felt that the first thing we needed to do was to establish manufacturing so that we could use the same process through trials and uh, to manufacture our cells commercially. So there'd never be a question of the cells being slightly different at any point if we changed manufacturing methods. At this point, our facility um, can make 150,000 doses a year. We use bioreactors, um, patented bioreactors, that we can scale out, just adding them in parallel to increase uh, our capacity. And with that technology, we can make 10,000 doses from a single placenta, which is the source of our cells. Um, we've had the process and the facility um, approved by the US, the EU, and Japan. The U.S., we did comparability studies for the FDA, which was uh, really uh, groundbreaking for us and for, for them. It was the first time they'd pursued that with a cell company. Um, and what we showed was by taking different donors of different placentas, running them in our old facility and our new facility in different bioreactors, three runs of bioreactor, we were producing exactly the same cell. And that batch-to-batch -batch consistency in commercial capacity is something that we felt was very important to establish before moving forward with um, later clinical development so that we wouldn't have to um, deal with it on the, um, when we would try to enter the market. And so close with me on a couple of events that I should be paying close attention to over the next 12 months. And also tell me a little bit about how involved you are in kind of those events and reachable for us for, and for investors in that space. 
Great. So I'm based in New York, though the rest of us are um, based in Israel. Um, so I'm here in Manhattan. I am always reachable. I have email and local phone number and happy to answer any questions or meet with people. Um, our milestones this year are pretty clear. We're initiating a pivotal phase two, though that sounds funny, but a, a pre-marketing phase two in EU and CLI, which is a 12 billion global market. We're initiating a um, pivotal or pre-marketing phase two in Japan, again for CLI. The US government is initiating the pivotal or final stage animal trials. We're expecting them to initiate this year. Um, in uh, our second product to treat acute radiation syndrome. And we have clearance to start our phase one in, um, in failure of engraftment of bone marrow transplantation here in the US. This is all forward looking, you know, we're expecting to initiate, of course. You know, we don't pay a lot of attention to things like acute radiation syndrome. And you mentioned that, you know, in the tragedy that there's a dirty bomb you know, and, and that uh, one of the things that will kill people, at least in the 15 kilometers outside the immediate blast radius, is going to be acute radiation syndrome or cancer or hematological uh, malfunction. And so you're saying that the government is kind of interested in medical countermeasures and that that's an area where Pluristem is working. Not something that any of us ever wants to think about, but it is kind of nice to know that, you know, you're working in this area. And certainly the therapeutic potential in that area could be huge, right? You were talking about cancer. Right. Okay, terrific. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Jason. Pleasure as always.